Okay, so my name is Rachel LeBlanc. I'm a community wellness and development planner uh, with Aboriginal Health and Community Wellness Division with uh, the Department of Health and Social Services. So I will start uh, here with Fred first. Uh, Fred Sangreeds, he was introduced this morning. Fred works for the Alanis Denny as the community negotiator on land claims and Acacho negotiations. Uh, today, he still participates in his traditional activities by traveling the land, hunting, and trapping. Fred loves traveling on his ancestors' trails throughout the Alanis Dene territory. Beside Fred, we have Alice. Alice's Dene name is Ali, and her English name is Alice Charlo Sangres Abel. Alice was raised in the Tado Cho Wool Bay area by her grandmother and auntie. She has lived entirely off the land and in unison with the environment. Allison uh, did attend residential school at the young age of six years old, um, but she has retained her language and her Dene culture. Uh, Alice has worked with various First Nations organizations in different capacities. In 1993, she started as the addiction counseling training in Catlo Diche, where she worked for six and a half years at the Natsajike Treatment Center in Catlo Diche. Uh, she has maintained her sobriety for over 31 years now. Alice has joined the Yellowknife Denny's First Nation Community Wellness in May of 1998 as a community wellness trainee, then as addictions counselor, community support worker, <coughs> delivering programs then she has worked her way up to the wellness director's position for five and a half years. She is part of the wellness team there, providing programming and services. And currently, she is working as the Denny Wellness Programmer, coordinating and delivering various Denny Wellness programs and on-the-land cultural programs. Besides uh, Alice, I have here uh, Jesse McKenzie. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesse is an Akecho Denny from Yellowknife Northwest Territories with roots in Lutzel Cay, Rocher River, and Catlo Diche. She is an ardent supporter and beneficiary of land based wellness programming in the beautiful Chief Dragies territory here. Her vision entails self determining communities where everyone contributes to dynamic land based wellness programs, in addition to experiencing the innumerable rewards of bush life. Jesse is honored to be here, uh, be part of the Pan Territorial On the Land Summit, and encourages everyone here to continue exchanging knowledge and best practices. So we will now start with our presentations, and Fred will be going first. So Fred, you're welcome to stand on the podium if you would like, or you can sit down. Hello. I come from the olden days where men used to be do things first. And recently, in the last several years, the women want to be first. I'll just change that. So I'm going to go first. <laughs> Helping her because she works in the same department. I'm going to do a little bit of history as well as uh, what's going on in the department, and then she's going to carry the way, take off with it. Anyways, uh, my name is Fred Sangres, a member of Yelena's Denny here, member of Keicho. Uh Ditching Tanawo, this program, uh, wellness program, one of the programs that was um, uh, set up in April 2015 was to, to help the uh, young generations here. As you know, uh, in our community here, like many other communities across Canada, we've been pushing for high school graduates, trying to get our young people involved, push them forward to get their education. But once they get the education, and then they're, they're at home and not moving forward. And uh, that's the same thing with us. We were concerned that uh, young people have uh, a lot of gift. They need to sometimes get a little push to, to move forward. And uh, this program was set up to help those individuals, uh, young women and young men. The program is called Dechin Tanawo. The Chintanawa was, uh, was uh, put together in April 2015. The program manager, Margaret Rasmus, who is not here, had to go on another uh, uh, conference. 
and Angus Sharlow, who is also a program coordinator, working with the young people, uh, is working with them today. He's, he's pretty busy. As you know, Angus Sharlow is the uh, son of the, uh, the chief, uh, former chief uh, Joe Sharlow. Joe Sharlow did taught a lot of uh, young drummers here uh, many, many years ago when uh, the drummers were disappearing and they had I guess they were looking out in the world for something different, and they lost touch with their community cultural. And it was Joe, uh, people like Joe Charlo, who brought those young people back, got them drumming, and uh, got their songs back. And uh, ever since then, we've been having uh, a lot of tea dance, hand games, and also the youth. I think the drums are bringing the youth back, and it's helping them to, to look beyond the... Uh, the, the future of the community. And uh, it's working really, really good because there was a hand game tournament uh, this past weekend where uh, Huati, young men from Huati and Clinchon region came in first and the Yelna's Dene in this region uh, came in uh, second. And there were some older men in there and younger men who were working together and teaching each other, working together to, to make that team. And congratulations to them. <coughs> and uh, this program that was set up is to try to help the young people in the community uh, to get some skills. As you know, skills is uh, something a lot of Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people, especially in the small communities, you don't have it. You don't have those kind of skills. But they have a, a different set of skills in the smaller communities. And that, those kind of skills is required so that one could be independent. And uh, by that, I mean uh, skills like hunting, trapping, and fishing. And those are the skills that are needed in the north. As you know that Aboriginal people, we live in one of the most extreme places on earth, and that's the cold. And uh, living with the cold, we have to train ourselves to be able to survive. As young hunters and trappers, they're able to get in the woods and having the, the skills that they need to harvest the food that they need and uh, bring it home and share with the community. By the way, uh, when I was introduced, he said I uh, hunt, fish, and trap, which is, which is true, but I also pick, pick berries too. And I found a great place to pick berries here. It's at the independent store, so if you want to pick berries in midwinter, go where I go. <laughs> That's why I usually go in July after I come back from land, tell my wife, Look what I pick. But <coughs> the, uh, one of the things that the young people uh, uh, are being taught is the basic carpentry. In order to build something for yourself, a shelter, a home, a cabin, you gotta have some uh, basic uh, skills. And uh, just building a simple log cabin requires a bit of skills. It's, it's not an easy thing. And so that's what happened with these young people. They were taught for job readiness, they were pre being prepared for pre-trades, uh, exam, preparation, basic carpentry, and then guess what they did? They took them on the land, not too far here. They built two camps. One was emergency shelter camp, another camp that's been constructed that they set up. They're actually helping the community here because uh, the community leaves here, come back, leaves here, they come back. Hunters go and all the time moving around so sometimes they require uh, shelter camps, places where they can spend a night in case of emergency, place where they can bring their families to if they needed to. And so those camps come real in really handy. And the young people who are working in the community here are giving something back by uh, building cabins on the land. And it helps the community, not only the hunter and trappers, but it helps the whole community, as well as other people that are on the land that need uh, shelter when they need to find one. So as well as uh, with that, they have a re uh, basic renovations where they can do home repair, do things uh, that they uh, require. The skills that they're looking for, I'm hoping that uh, it will help them in the a, in a, in a future. Because what we don't have on this beautiful lake here is that all the commercial fishermen, our grandfathers, our grandfathers uh, and fathers who were fishermen, all retired. They are no longer on the lake. What we don't have on this lake is new, new commercial fishermen here. And there, there is a market out there, 
and there and when one's not doesn't want to be involved with mining or that kind of industry but want to have a more co uh, traditional cultural life well that kind of lifestyle is right in the front door here so they're being taught for those kind of things to watch out for and as well as uh hunting uh they're being trained to to hunt so that they can survive and bring food back so that one day they should have their own family they need to be able to provide and uh, not, not have to worry about having no food in, in your home. And all our food is right in the back door here. Uh, one thing they're looking at for, for down the road is morel mushroom picking. Thank God they're not after the blueberry. <laughs> they're after the mushroom berry picking. So what's happening here? Uh, I think the benefit of forest fires, uh, it, it benefits in many ways. One is that it'll give new growth to the land. It will rechange and recharge the land and uh, the wildlife that depends on it will be much more important. But at the same time, when a forest fire is burned, there is a market for morel uh, mushroom picking. And it's been uh, probably about three, three straight years in a row that uh, the north here, north arm, people have been picking a lot of berries, or well, not berries, mushrooms. And it's been helping people with uh, their income. Because school is out, parents are out in the wilderness, and I've seen uh, people living on a, on, a, on a road, on winter road, or the summer roads, uh, with whole family out of school, and picking berries and making good income. And so those are the kind of things that's happening. But the, uh, the more is that the, the program, Dechintanawo, which means bush programs, was set up to help the Yelnas Dene with the younger generation to, as uh, Jimmy would say, we'll get up early in the morning, throw them out in the door, well, we don't throw people out the door anymore. That was before. But now, we're trying to get young people up early in the morning with the sun and get up. Just like the ancestors, you get up early in the morning, you go out at night, go check your rabbit snares, go check your net, you come back when the sun's up, then you're, you're ready, you bring food back to the, yourself. You're, you're having food. Then you have your lunch or your breakfast at the same time. It's the same thing today. The, the same kind of concept today is that you got to get up early, to go to work, and make a living. It's the same thing. So there's training happening in both ways, giving them ideas that the, the it might be pretty hard to get up, but you know if you want to survive, one has to get up, and that's training and getting up and being on time is one of those things that's going to help them, because that seems to be the hardest hardest part after high school. When you finish high school. It's, it's not about retirement. <laughs> you can't tell the dad, oh, I did it, I'm going to retire now. Give me some allowance, so I'll be okay. Well, that's not how the world works. You graduate, you have to keep pushing yourself, move forward. Just like uh, in the olden days, our ancestors used to train you, educate you. When you're ready, they'll send you across the lake with a dog team. Hope, hopefully, you'll be back in a few months with a lot of fur and be able to survive. Well. The concept of getting up in the morning and getting out there in the world, it's, a, it's the same thing. But it's, it's a trying world and it's, uh, it's a tough world, but it's, uh, it's a way one has to be uh, independent and get out. So that's what we're doing with our young people. And Alice here works in the same department here with our wellness program, but she's much more on the counseling and working with the young people. Uh, although we do have uh, a lot of young people who sign up who are very interested in the Dinchintan Awo program that's happening. It's a very successful program. Recently, we went, took those young people, kind of gave them a reward. We left Yellowknife. We went about 140 miles up to the tundra. We wanted to see the, the landscape. We wanted them to see the changes of the lands as you go further north. The trees are here, quite a bit of trees, but as you go further north, about 140 miles north, the trees disappear. We're trying to educate them that in order to survive here, you must know the country very well. And if you're gonna go further out in the distance, you know that where there's no firewood, there's a different way of taking the surviving up there, different techniques where you have to haul wood and get all your equipment to take with you so that in times when things are bad, you can still be able to survive. So we, we taught them about survival, we taught them about traveling, about seeing, not so much in the classroom about looking at pictures and stuff, but actually doing it. You know, we, 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 want, we want them to experience the hands getting cold, the cold, the feet, everything else. 
They have to understand that we live in one of the most extreme conditions on Earth, which is uh, cold, and they did experience that. So that gives them a little bit of experience. So the next time they go out or with their families, they know the conditions and how they should dress warm and what to bring and how, they should, uh, how they're going to survive up there. So that's the kind of training they're getting. We do have a, a number of uh, young people uh, signed up. Uh, it, it was uh, come and go because some of them have chosen to go other careers and other training. And some uh, have them through their little bit of training. I think that some of them gone to the mines, but the majority of them are still with the classroom and still want to complete right to the end so that they can get the skills that, we, that, need for, uh, that they need to require them for, for job preparation. And uh, that's what's happening with our young people here. Uh, it started in April uh, 2015, only a couple of years, but we're still trying to build on it. Uh, we're working with the hunters and trappers and elders in the community for advice so that we can make this program a lot better. How can we, um, how can we make the young people be part of the community, but also be responsible in the community, but at the same time uh, have the skills of adults as parents and able to live in, in, a, in a beautiful community and live with people, as well as working on land like their fathers and ancestors did, continue to re rely on the resources that's out there and still be able to be independent. And uh, as my father always said, in, uh, the world is changing for us. We must plant our feet in both worlds in order to survive. And that's what we're trying to do, plant our feet in both worlds. After five, you go over there and be who you are. You could put your Tarzan suit on and go and do your fishing or whatever. But nine to five, you know, we're still uh, work at work. We do have uh, professional jobs. We still have uh, jobs that we carry on. Outside of our job, we, we go back on the land. We depend on the land. So we do have our, both of our feet planted on the world that, uh, that's going to, well, to challenge the world, I guess, to take on the world. And that's how uh, uh, the illness then are doing it, is to plan both feet in the world so they both understand both worlds and how they can move forward. Thank you with that. Merci Cho. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, we'll have an opportunity for some questions after the next two. So we'll have Alice Abel go up next with her presentation. And I think it's up on the... what I, I just mentioned that I want to thank everyone for coming here today as a visitor to our country, to, to our community. I'd like to thank you all for being here. And we're all here to learn, uh, to talk about our, our um, land program, but our, you know, what's working good and what the challenges uh, we're going through and that and how we can best provide the programs on the land program in our communities. And the knowledge, the knowledge of, the, of all the elders in here, you know, they live off the land and they live by 
through hunting, trapping, fishing, and also applying the Dene laws into their life and to have a strong family. Like you mentioned earlier about residential school, a lot of our, of our people went to residential school and lost their, their way of life and that. And so with this, with the presentation, preserving our Dene tradition way of life, this is what's about uh, uh, teaching the young people. They're the generation that were, they were, their multi-generation impact from the residential school. And so with that, I would like to do my presentation. Before I start, I would like to, you know, to honor all the elders in this hall here. Um, because, you know, they pass on all the traditional teachings. So with that, it's very powerful to present this. And I just want to say that picture with, um, with the elder with the pink scarf and the young lady, that's me. And that's my grandmother. And when, um, uh, when Rachel introduced me, and she, uh, she mentioned that I was raised by my grandmother, and that's who's, you know, uh, and her name um, is Marie. And she's the one that raised me. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll, I'll start my presentation here. Preserving our, our Dene tradition way of life by Ali. That's my Dene name. I thought there was music in the background. What happened? Yeah, there is some music. Hello. Oh, hello. Okay, hello. Okay, there. Okay. Okay, you guys already know about me, who I am, so I'll skip that. Okay, the YKD event vision statement. A healthy and sovereign Willy Day nation with, with excellent governance. Wellness goal and objectives. Preserving, strengthening, and maintaining our Dene way of life for our children, youth, families, elders, and individuals to live a holistic lifestyle. Objectives, to promote, preserve, and strengthen our Dene culture and traditional teachings. Teachings and applying tradition, Dene traditional skills, teachings of the traditional knowledge of the land, to support and enhance healthy family relationship, to promote and encourage healthy lifestyle choices, to empower our youth self-esteem, confidence, and leadership skills to promote and provide holistic healing and recovery process. Spiritual ceremony at the Willie Day Culture Site at the Yelnai River. That's a place where annually our, our relatives and our great-great-grandparents and grandfathers and the people they used to gather there, so it's a uh, it's a sacred place for for us as the Dene people. Ye yearly, like within a year, there's a lot of gatherings that um, that takes place over there. Dene laws passed down from generations to generations. These contribute to to healthy families and all that dry fish hanging there that's making me hungry. <laughs> Feasting and storytelling protects and preserve our Dene traditional ways of life. Ways. A lot of people gathering together, coming together to socialize. Connecting with each other. Greeting each other with, with Affection is important for our well-being. Children and youth are sacred. 
We are dedicated to keeping families healthy and on the land, being on the land. Grandmothers, mothers, and babies are sacred. They are so cute. The connection between the grandmother and the mom. Elders connect the past, present, and future with their love and traditions. Connecting with our spirit, mind, heart, body, and people while drum dancing in the sacred life, in the circle of life, and connecting with Mother Earth. I just want to dance while I'm up here. These young women's grandfathers volunteered their time to take care of people. The young women are following their, grandpa their grandfather's footsteps. The beat of the drums are the heartbeats of our young people. Drumming and, and songs and prayer songs are one with the heartbeats of, of the young people. Traveling on the river of life. Like all these activities that's going on at the Willie Day culture site, that's what our people used to do. The beauty of nature, water is life and sacred. On the land program for children and youth at McKinsey Island, there's an eagle right on top of the tree, and the program is right on that island there. Prayers and tobacco offerings to the sacred water for guidance and strength and to give thanks. In kind of gatherings, what we do is that we open with our prayers. So that's where the young drummers are going to do the drumming and praying. And after the setting up camps, the young people are learning from from the um, workers there. It, um, introducing themselves to others. And some of the young people, it's the first time to speak in a large group in front of people. Building trust and relationship with one another. These are different kind of activities. Looks like they're having fun there, connecting with each other building the relationship, building trust. Learning the traditional skills and harvesting traditional food, caribou meat, cutting up caribou meat and making dry fish. And these young girls are learning how to, how to cook bannock. Uh, bannock cook over the fire. There's two ways of cooking it. And this young boy that's cleaning the fish, after it was clean, he cleaned that fish and threw it over the grill to cook and share the food with others. As, as we say, that then in laws we share our food. And learning to sew these young girls. And the, the young boy that's chopping wood, that's his father, teaching him how to chop wood and how to, how to stand and also how to hold the uh, the acts. Learning the tradi traditional skills of moose hide tanning. The young girls are putting the moose hide in a frame. Berries. Harvesting berries. That's cranberries there. And this is um, each of the group, they w um, uh, we broke them into groups and we educate them on the awareness of uh, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I didn't go up there to make a presentation, and I just uh, wrote the questions and I broke them up into group, and, and I said, all of you, in one way or another, you know 
you know, what's happening at home, in the community, with that information, you know, to share it. So that's what they have done. As you see, there is, um, you know, some of them are young girls and some are youth. So the, uh, the older ones are mentoring the young girls, uh, old boys. L learning about the leadership. Um, all these young um, youths and children are learning about um, the chief's position, what he does, and the band council, what are their roles and responsibility, and what, what they need to, uh, to learn, uh, you know, what is it that the kind of skills they need about uh, getting into leadership. And these young girls there, they, they were honored in taking the leadership training program. And taking responsibility, you know, around the camp, washing dishes, and hanging the blanket over um, the rope to keep it dry. And taking care of self, which is really important. Leisure time. What I notice about these young people is that when there's a baby around, the kids, they like to go around the babies, just being with them. And that's how it used to be that I remember. And the other young person wants to be a photograph, likes to take pictures. He wants to become, you know, taking pictures and that. Relaxation and leisure time to enjoy each other's company. See the little baby there that's sitting and all those young girls around her? Empowered and inspired young people. All those young people were taking part in the land program. And families meeting their loved ones and they're coming back from the, uh, from the land program. On the land program for children and youth at B. Dene. Bobby Dragis is the owner of B. Dene along with his wife, Jennifer Dragis. And Jennifer Dragis is the director of wellness. She's my boss. And the kids learning how to. How to make birch bark. Uh, can you? And the young girls learning to sew. And language. Learning about the Dennis syllabics. So those um, young people were really interested in writing uh, in syllabics. And here on the left side. Um, they're pronouncing what they have on, on the paper, like the one with the green, the young girl in the green. It says, don't let a, means bannock, Jenny bannock. And here, valuable learnings of the unique traditional skills in preparation of moose hide tanning. These young girls learning about the different techniques. Preparation for making drums from Caribou Heights. As you can see in a tent there, there is that, the frame of the drums. Then on the right-hand side, um, the resource person, Paul, is showing the young people of how to put the tie around the drum. And these young people are, are spending time together, leisure time. and. On the left-hand side, those young children are very happy to be together, and they're having fun. Family going out on the land, you know, when a you know, family, they, uh, they go out on the land, they make the connections with, with each other, building healthy relationship with self, with families, with their children. And Rachel looks pretty happy there. Just enjoying the sun there and the wind, cool breeze from the lake, and the family being together there. And the baby being in the swing, the father's tying the baby on the swing there. Looks like the, the baby's enjoying 
to self. And this is um, where the connection with the family, with the children and youth, going out fishing. Belief in Yourself program. This program ran, um, we, we delivered two, twice over the years. And, and we started out with 25 participants. And so there was quite a bit of numbers of participants that completed the program. And um, you know, when, um, when, you know, when we're busy all the time, and, and I'm feeling overwhelmed. And we get so tense, and this is where we're releasing the tension in our bodies. And learning to sew, making moccasins. Some of these ladies, it's their first time how to make moccasins. Learning to sew, making moccasins. Sew machine, using a sew machine to put it together sitting around, socializing, and our resource person, people, two elders and our cook, and women's retreat at, at Mackenzie Island, and making medicine cream from, from spruce gum. It's very powerful medicine. And the one on the left, all the jars was filled and then the participant brought it home and they kept one for themselves and, and the others they gave it out to families. Our elders showing us how to make dry meat from caribou meat. Dry meat and dry fish making. Oh wow, that one was really huge. Dry fish there. Making dry fish. That's a trout. Presentation and challenges and solutions to challenges. Coming together and talking about the challenges we face in our community and the solutions, how to work around the challenges. And the women's retreat here at the end, we had a drum dance and then greeting each other, saying goodbye to each other. Even because once we're together, for days, you know, we become to, you know, like get uh, like comfortable, and I want to leave the group. On the land healing workshop, we had healing workshop. A lot of people participated. Cindy, my co-worker, um, she's delivering the grief and loss workshop, healing workshop, and and the families are together. And cultural program, went to programs. Our elder is showing us how to how to uh, to clean muskrat. Starting a fire to heat up the drums. Snowshoe race. Some of these ladies is the first time to to put on a snowshoe. The outcome of of on the land program. Healing of one, healing of all. Increase their sense of meaning in life, gaining self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence, and positive, positive attitudes. Carry on with our Dene traditional way of life. A deeper respect for the land, nature, and the environment. Stronger integrational connection and relationship with each other. Strengthening family bonds, love, caring, and respect for each other. Understanding more about traditional roles and responsibility. Building healthy relationship with families. Unders understanding the importance connection between elders and youth. In youth increasing their awareness of our Dene culture and Dene laws. Youth staying in school. Strong, healthy peer support. Preventing young people from entering the criminal justice system. Reduce risk behavior among youth at risk. Reduce substance abuse, prevents family violence. Keeping the knowledge of the medicinal plants.
the wellness pro the wellness program. These are all the programs that they were then a wellness program. The the wellness program still ever. After care program after care, after care not care. after care service back to school celebration believe in yourself program career fair Chukwa after school program Christmas annual craft sale Christmas and box day celebration community cultural activities community garden counseling sessions and referral to treatment couples retreat crisis su support team elders Christmas party. Um, elders luncheon and also elders and youth um, bridging a gap workshop family nights program family violence awareness week activities girls group grief and loss workshop hand games tournament health fair home visit justice committee committee meeting monthly meetings justice program kids Easter par party clin um, legal clinic Mama and Baby a program, March Spring Break Land program, Matrix Outpatient Treatment program, Men's Empowerment Circle, Men's Haircuts, Men's Sharing Circles, National Addiction Awareness Week activities, On the Land Family program, On the Land Healing program for men, On the Land Healing program for women, RCMP drug information sessions, Recreation and sports activities, soccer program, hockey, swimming, spring break, uh, youth camp, spring carnival, summer culture program, traditional parenting program, um, Valentine's Day celebration, women's empowerment circle, women's retreat, women's sewing group, youth council, um, youth hand games program, youth leadership. Oh, there's, yeah. So those, all the programs that has been delivered delivered. Masicho, forgive me in this opportunity to share the awesome experiences for the participant and the wellness staff in our traditional and cultural land programs. YKDFN um, Wellness Division. Masicho for listening. Thank you so, so much, Alice. What a beautiful presentation. Uh, next up, we'll have uh, Jesse. Uh, did you want the microphone brought back to the podium here, if that's if we can do that? And then Jesse will go up next. Then we'll um, just have a brief recap and then open it up to some questions and answers. Hi, I'm happy to see all of you here. I yeah, that's perfect, thank you. <laughs> um, I definitely see some familiar faces here, so hello. Um, so as you know, my name is Jesse McKenzie. I'm a member of the All Knives Dene First Nation. Um, I used to work as a wellness program assistant and I also participated in uh, one of the women's retreats. Um, this retreat, it was an on-the-land program uh, for wo women only, of course, and it specifically um, addressed uh, trauma and addictions, and those are two of the biggest barriers that uh, um, our women face. Um, I'm going to highlight the theme of uh, culture. Um, so we were at the dry geese camp. Um, we were under... Um, the supervision of emerger, um, sorry, we are under the um, supervision of elders and emerging elders, healers and emerging healers. Um, they facilitated a number um, of activities. Um, this included uh, harvesting berries. There, um, we didn't take any trips to independent. Um, sharing circles, um, laughter yoga, uh, body mapping, uh, hikes. Uh, and sewing. Um, we were able to access traditional and contemporary teachings, um, which is fitting because we do um, exist in two worlds, um, as Fred mentioned before. Um, participants were challenged to identify the root causes um, of their addictions. Um, it was very challenging. Um, Alice and the facilitators, they definitely knew what they were doing. 
and they were able to handle um, the roller coaster uh, of emotions um, that that existed there. Um, so Alice and the facilitate Alice and the facilitators definitely lived up to uh, the Dene law of helping each other. Um, for example, they helped the participants by providing um, a safe space to express themselves um, without fear of being stigmatized. Um, and that was very important. Um, the outcomes as I saw them were increased trust between everyone. Um, and without trust, you, you can't have <laughs> a good relationship. It doesn't matter what kind of relationship it is. And um, everybody trusted Alice Alice's methods, which only accelerated their healing, and we were all very grateful for that. So, Messi Cho Alice. Um, I cannot emphasize the importance of having female Indigenous counselors who specialize in addictions and trauma in the North. Um, I strongly encourage more Indigenous women to pursue, to pursue, pursue this field. Um, Although the, cro the program was very valuable, um, it was only for one week. Um, it does happen annually. Um, I don't think that's enough time to, to make a huge impact and influence the social change that we need. Um, our First Nation government and community members, you know, we have a lot of work to do to ensure members have um, regular access to on-the-land wellness programs. And I definitely think that this is an achievable goal. Um, you know, I, I believe in that because we're all here together at this symposium to advance um, on the land wellness programs. And that is all I have to say for now. Masi Cho. Okay, thank you very much, Jesse. Um, so maybe before we go into the question and answers, we just heard from Jesse, I'll just do a very quick recap of uh, Fred and Alice. So Fred went through um, their very successful Dishinta Nau program, meaning uh, bush programs, and that's the program that they use to help their uh, Yellow Knives Denny uh, young people. So they teach them those basic skills. Um, he gave some examples such as carpentry, uh, hunting, fishing, morale mushroom picking, and not so much in a classroom setting, although there is some, but they actually get out and go out on the land and do it. So very uh, nice presentation. Alice went through um, various uh, wellness programming. She gave us a beautiful window view of the Yellow Knives Denny. Um, really loved that presentation. Um, she went through their way of life, um, uh, showed their many programs that they do, again, out on the land, uh, their cultural activities, all their workshops. Uh, very inspired, makes me want to be outside right now and get out there. So thank you very much for that. And then, of course, we just finished up with Jesse. So I'm sure there are some questions out there that some of you uh, may have that you'd like to, to ask them. If you do, we can um, pass around this microphone. And I'll just, uh oh, OK, one moment here. Before you get to questions. Does anybody have a truck that's parked in front of the no parking sign where they deliver the water? If you think that might be you, go and check, because they can't bring the water because there's a truck in the way. Right out here. Sorry. All right, thank you. Okay, so I'll grab that mic there, and I'll pass uh, that around for anyone who may have questions. And then maybe, Jesse, I'll just hand this mic to you, and then you can pass it to whoever will be answering the question. Okay, so any, oh, okay, here we go. Norman has a question. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for telling your experience about the, uh, you got a lot of programs happening here in, in this area here, and I want to ask uh, the presenters, uh, how, how do you measure, measure the impact or, or the success of the program? What's your measurement? Do you do evaluation after six months or a year and say, well, this is what we're doing and it's working or we need to make some changes here? Do you have some method of measuring 
the success of your program. We've got a good thing going here. Let's keep it going. You know, and so I want to ask, how do we, um, how do you measure that to satisfy, sometimes you've got to satisfy your funders or even the people themselves. But more importantly, the people who are taking the program. Mm -hmm. And they say, thank God I came, did this program a year ago or two years ago. You know, taught me something. Masi. Thank you. Go ahead. In all the programs that, um, uh, that we did, um, do deliver, um, there is that evaluations. So that way we get input from the participant, what is working and what is not working. Like, um, like when we have on the land program, there were more land programs. So this year, um, last month we delivered two land programs. And in the month of May, we have an, an, another one. May, June, we have another one. Two days, and two days in June. And three days in July, three days in August, three, uh, three days in, um, in September, November, and February. So like we do have the evaluation from the participant. That way we know what, you know, what are their needs. And based on their needs, th that's what we, we you know, um, plan and implement um, the program. And I noticed that over the years, um, like the family night program, a lot of families are coming out to the program. Before when it started many years ago, it was in memory, but now there, I'll say, you know, there's lots. There's, um, uh, I do have pictures of them and that, but uh, this was only based on that program, so I didn't include other pictures that, that, um, that was taken, taken the, um, in the programs. So evaluation is really important from, from the participants. That's how we know what are their needs. All right, thank you. Did you want to add anything else to your comments, Norman? Or? Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Rachel. Um, I'm thinking that um, the program that you, you do run, it's good. And uh, what I, I like what uh, Fred was saying, that you, when you go out on the land, you, you teach them to go different parts of the land, what to do in different areas of the land. And um, I guess for myself is, you take these, um, you have this program, you take these young people out there, and they do this for, for a bit, and then they come back into a different lifestyle. You know, they live in a different lifestyle, and after a while, they go back out to the land. It's a different lifestyle again, a whole different world. And they're slowly switching back and forth. And most of today's kids is back into the modern world. When we were growing up, that was our life. And we really wanted to get into the other world. You know, it was running water and TV and electricity. But we didn't have that life. The life that we're now going back to teach our kids, well, that was our life. And we didn't know any other, any other life than that. You know, that was, that was how we were raised. So now we're going back into teaching our kids this is our life. You don't, can't, flick the, can't flick the switch. You've got to light a candle or know how to put a gas lamp on, how to put a mantle on. You know, like you said, how to make a fire, what kind of wood to burn, what kind of wood to cut, how to cut the wood, how to split it, you said, how to hold an ax, when to split the wood, how to make kindling. You can't flick the furnace on in the morning. In a cabin or a tent, you've got to make a fire. And it's not always warm, especially in the wintertime. So I'm trying to figure out uh, you know, after five years, if you have somebody going out 15 years old, I'm trying to figure out after five years, do you go back to that 
that person say, well, was, was this a good program for you? Did you learn something from this? You know, what are they doing in life now? You know, I, I guess that's what I'm looking about, evaluation. But Richard, I think that's what I'm saying. You, you run a good program, it's really successful, I've seen that. It's a good program, and uh, I'm trying to figure out long-term effects. Mm -hmm. You know, to run a real good program, it takes about a good five years. You know, but that's, that's when you start seeing the really impacts of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I'm trying to get some long-term effects to the, to the program. Um, I think once uh, the Allen Ives Denny Wellness Department uh, develops more capacity, uh, that more uh, advanced uh, wellness program evaluation will take place. Um, but like with any uh, big project, you know, uh, people have to take baby steps. And that's what's happening right now. So, yeah, Messi. Thank you. All right, I'll just go down here. If there's anything else you guys want to add in between questions, anything for your presentations, feel free to go ahead. Okay, if you don't mind just introducing yourself before you have your say your comment. My name is Mary Rose McSack from Cambridge Bay. <coughs> I'm actually uh, from here, from Dedda. My dad's picture is up there and my mother's picture. Those two are my cousins. The question I like to ask is, um, now that we see all the DNA culture, I think it would be a good idea if we could exchange culture. People from here can go up to Cambridge Bay, show them their culture, and people from Cambridge Bay youth could come down here and exchange cultures. For example, I have a granddaughter that I have adopted since she was three years old. She's Miss Nunavut, and she's Dene, Inuvialuit, and Nunavut Newt. So if she could come here and explain to the young people here in Dada how self-esteem is so important. She could come here and let the youth know that they could go further. She's going to be going to Florida for Miss Canada Petite uh, as a contestant. So these things are successful stories of youth, but we don't know what our youth are doing. Some of them are very successful, but we just don't know about it. So I think cultural exchange would be a good idea. We just need to look for fundings. Masicho Kwana. Thank you. Did anyone want to add a comment to that up there? I'll say something to, to what she's saying. Back when I was about about 17, I had a, a great opportunity to go to Nunavut. Went to Ikaluit and Pamuntang. The elders there in Pamuntang said, um, you guys are, are in my country. You need to experience what it's like to sleep in an igloo. I thought it was going to be really cold. There was about, about, six, uh, about six or seven of us. You know, the students, were, I was going to a three-piece um, school there, and we went on a cross-country uh, tour. And that's where uh, I ended up in Pangmikan. And it was an awesome experience, sleeping in the igloo. I thought it was going to be cold, but it's not. When you mentioned about you know, you know, to exchange our cultural that's a good way to. I just want to share that. Merci. Hi, my name is Anna Lee McLeod. I'm from Aklavik, Northwest Territories. And I teach the Gwich'in language for K to 9. And you talked about um, a lot of the opportunities that you are able to provide for the youth. I want to. Um, say Masi Cho for that, uh, for our community of 600, you know that the limited um, dollars that we would get 
I think I wanted to speak on be, um, say something about evaluation. Uh, when you guys said that there are some of the youth that walked away and still hunt and trap in that today, to me that's an evaluation of perfect success. Um, and then as they were talking, I thought of um, when it was said, turn the light switch on and off from primer stove, that's part of circle of life is what I thought because um, I can tell you my grandmother in McPherson, she had to um, quit using her language so she never spoke to my mother. Although my mother would hear bits and parts when her parents would talk in the language but they would only speak to each other like secretly. And uh, then when I came along, I went to sub at a school and heard the language. And I don't know how to explain it, but when I heard the kids speaking, trying to speak the language, it touched my heart to the point where I've been there now for 15 years. And uh, I can tell you, I was one that did not want to be out on the land. If we had to go out on the land, muskrating, uh, until freeze, until the ice broke up and then we come back to town, I would go and hike at my uncle's or if I was going, um, cordless curling irons were around then. I was taking that with me. Uh, and to this day, uh, opposites attract. Um, I am Guchin. My husband is Inivialukton. And we both, he loved the land, which I didn't. And now we both like being out on the land. We have our children, and they talk about elders. We're losing our elders. My oldest son turned 28, and he loves the land. When he was 12, he would get out of school, get on a skidoo, take his rifle, and get caribou. That was 45 minutes up in the mountains. He, by the time we were done work, he would come home and he'd have it all cut out, cut up, and he would give it out to the families that couldn't hunt. So, and from there, I was told, "Well, there's your elder," because he had a young person who did things for an elders. But um, I don't want to take up too much time. I just want to acknowledge you guys for t finding the time and working with these youth, because they are our future. And these programs and seeing them, it's just given me more spark, which was mentioned today as well, to um, search for more dollars and do a lot of more youth things. So with that, I just want to say, Masi Cho. Okay. We do have time for uh, some more questions or comments. There are people coming in, but we have about another 15 minutes, so don't feel rushed. We still have time. Thank you. Um, my name is Tanya Makvatsov. I'm with uh, ENR. I work in conservation planning. Uh, just my question is, how can government and NGOs better support these kinds of initiatives? Capacity building, funding. I, I would say um, really knowing um, the community and the organization and finding opportunities for partnerships, however big or small those partnerships be. And I will let Alice give her input now. With the funding situation is um, like, um, the only way that I'm looking at it is a partnership with other, um, other organization because it costs lots to deliver land programs. Like, you know, you really have to account for, you know, everything that you need to take out and to go on the land with. So, so a partnership is, is the key. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did Fred want to add anything to that at all? Thank you. Well, <coughs> I think governments are important. I 
we'll put it this way. They have the dollars. And as First Nations, uh, we don't have the money here. We, we, we're basically looking for money all the time. We're looking for partnership. Uh, every First Nation, not only Yelena is done here, but all the First Nations across the north here are always looking for funding, anywhere in any area, area. They want to do great things for the community. They want to do things for the community. They want to do things for the youth. And there's never enough money in the community at all. We try to do fundraising, try to do bingo, but those things are just, they don't bring in a lot. And uh, you have to work really hard for it. But I think the, the basic ideas could be that uh, First Nations uh, have dreams. They have uh, things that they want to do. But the government needs to attach himself to the community to come forward. We can't be chasing the, the governments because we don't know all the departments. They, they just recently, all the numbers have been changed in departments and, and uh, other new departments were created. So how do we as First Nation know the, uh, the governments or what, where the dollars are? And I think it's up to the government to advertise themselves or come forward to the community and say, we have these uh, dollars and w these are initiatives we'd like to do with you. Is there a way for a partnership to work with you? And I think the First Nation uh, and Aboriginal community is going to say, yes, we have these programs, we have these things, uh, can you help us in these areas? It's always like that. It's always funding, always seems to be uh, needed in the community. In the olden days, we did everything ourselves. If we wanted to take youth out, we got the dog team together, we got the youth, we went to the parents and say, let me your son, I want to make a slave out of him for 10 days. Sure, take him. <laughs> In old days, it was like that. You know, you, you take the people with you, and you, any way you can get help, and at the same time, they, gain, they benefit from it. At the same time, they, they gain knowledge and skills from that as well, and as, as well as working around people, being able to work with the community, you know. You get to know one another. And I, th I think that's, that's how, how it was in the olden days. But now, today, we're influenced by lots of things in the world. Very influenced. And one of those things are, is that uh, the elder keep talking about is the little gadget. He said one student can bump into 10 poles in a day. Is it just walking like that. And it's true. We've seen it. <laughs> we see young people walking like that. And um, Bobby, who's our outfitter here in the community, he does work with us. He has a policy. If you go to Bobby's camp, he's going to check all your pockets. He's going to take all those gadgets away. He's going to take the battery out of your pocket. He's going to make sure you have nothing out of hanging and out of your ear or wires because he wants to teach you. And if you have something else that influences you, you're not paying attention, well, really, you're not really interested in the program. And that's how it is. It's only when one really wants to learn, wants to be involved, then you grab those people. You get them involved, and they're going to go a long ways. We did that to about uh, three or four of our young people here. And they were interested. Today, they are drummers. One of them is uh, of the bank council. I think, how old is he, 23, 24? Very young. <laughs> but that's because they pushed themselves forward, and they wanted to, to, to make an example. They wanted to become something or somebody. And they push themselves forward. So when we see that, we help them. We, we give them a hand and take their hand and, and lead them and try to teach them. But there are other ones, too, who are uh, young people who have other interests. But we have other programs for them. We take them on the land. And uh, further away from the community, we work with them to do more uh, counseling, to do more work with them, to do a lot of talking to them. Because they're not getting the talk at home. So we, we do that for them at, on the land. And the land is a place to do it because the land is, uh, the atmosphere for land is like a miracle. It's, uh, it's like a magic place, you know. You can't do it in the, in the government buildings and four room where you put young people in there. That's not a comfortable zone. That's an uncomfortable zone. So we take them in, in to a, an, an area where they're more comfortable to be free, to be able to expand their minds and, and not be shy at all. So that's, that's how we, uh, we move forward. But a lot of the young uh, people who we worked with many, many years ago uh, moved on. They're either married or they're, they're working or they've gone to university, but they've made that move. Now we have a, a young people who graduated several years ago, and those ones are at home.
Nurse, nurse once are we're, we're pulling them out, saying, come with us, you know. You, you graduated, you have skills here. We're going to teach you more. We, we want you to move forward. Um, the chief here and the community here, uh, at one time we said we had no leaders. The leader here was crying in the community uh, with elders at one time. That's like 20 years ago, was crying in the community. I'm crying because I don't have any leaders, he said. I'm tired and I, I can't lead you no more. It's up to you to find the leaders. <coughs> so the elders, that's what they did. They went out, searched, and they got leaders. They got so many leaders. I think today uh, we, we got too many chiefs and not enough members. Put it that way. <laughs> we have lots of young leaders coming forward because of that. And then uh, we got some young leaders who are interested in the government, self-government, and they are getting involved. And then we have some young people who was a full-time trapper. My, my uh, nephew who was trapping with me uh, years ago, he's, gone, he's graduated, he's gone to university in Royal University in Toronto. He's uh, taken uh, uh, political, uh, what do you call it? Science. He's taken science. And he went from trapping to science. Computer science, right? Uncle, don't worry, I'm going to invent something for you on a trap line, he says. I know what it is, it's camera. Camera can only catch a picture, but I want to catch a real one. So he's going to come back and try to invent something. He, he, these are young people who are expanding their minds and want to do things. And we give them the freedom to do it. But there are, like I said, there are other ones who are maybe a little bit shy and don't want to come out. We'll pull them out, get them involved. And that's, that's how they come out. Merci. Okay, thank you very much, Fred. We have time um, for just uh, one. I have one more gentleman here uh, for two brief comments, and then um, we'll have to wrap up here. Hi, my name is Bernadette Dean, and I just wanted to encourage you guys to uh, keep up the cultural learning. In our region, we've been running culture camps since 1998, since we were still part of NWT. <coughs> some people, some bureaucrats might have the attitude that what we are teaching is not authentic, but never believe that because our oral histories are so strong and oral history knowledge is really strong. And the proof is finding of um, Franklin ship <laughs> and learning our cultural ways and language can only be a good thing and it's not only the responsibility of indigenous people I think everyone should take a responsibility for that local governments governments organizations and not only leave it to indigenous organizations to um, take a responsibility for. It's all our responsibility as Canadians or whoever we may be. And But I just have one question for, I think, the one in the middle. Alice, where did you get all the funding for all the programs you listed? Thank you. Well, uh, from all the different um, places with the government, with different um, different organizations, a bit here, there, a little bit here and there, and compile it all together. So that's how we've been delivering programs. And then, and then the other thing that we've been encouraging families to go out on the land, the Waikiki even um, uh, the wellness and the, the Waikiki even uh, have um, built cabins in different places. And uh, there's um, um, one at Mason, at Jenny John Lake, uh, another one at Metonabe Bay, uh, Willow Lake. Uh, there's other couple more cabins. So yeah, there's seven cabins out out on the, on the land, encouraging you know families to go out to take the initiative to go out with their families because you know there's cabins out there. Those cabins are not locked. The doors are open for them, you know, to welcome themselves and the family, you not know, to spend a week or weekends and not long weekends. So that's another way of, you know, um, 
encouraging the families to go out, experience uh, being out on the land. I'm just going to make one quick comment uh, relating to funding and um, how NGOs and governments can support the programs. Uh, well, one um, way is to um, make your guidelines less strict. And also, like as I said before, like get to know like our organizations, and that doesn't mean like sending emails because people get hundreds, if not thousands, of emails a month. Like we're very, very bogged down, and that face-to-face -face communication uh, is golden. You know, so I, I encourage people to do that. Just you know, come visit us, and you know, see um, see where that takes you. Thanks. Okay, so we have one last comment here, and then we'll um, close off and start our break. Hello, <coughs> my name's Jimmy Dillon. I'm from Delany. I'm an elder. I'm over here to listen to you people. And I've been listening to you. Then we did little, uh, we took some kids out in the land to exercise what, you know, what we need to do. And Two weeks, we, we had enough money for two weeks, so we did our two weeks, and we did pretty good. And the kids were happy with it, and all the elders were happy. But I was listening to Norman, but uh, he's trying to find out, he's trying to get the answer for, the, for what he's saying, but nobody gave him the answer. And I think I know what he's talking about. This training kids out in the land, traditional knowledge. For me, I never went to school. I never went to no residential school. I learned my English from my, my grandfather. He went to residential school. He tells me all the stories about what's happening over there. And today, we're asking for help. How many residential school people in here? Those people need help too. And our kids, our young kids need help. We elders, we have the knowledge. We got all the experience that our, we learn from our elders that we have to pass it to the young people. But we're all getting old. We already lost many of them. There's only few of us left. So, with my experience, after looking at everything, that what people say, the people that went to residential school have to be, I said that many years ago, they have to be trained again, to like going to school again from the elders, elders like me. Because they never have a chance to learn anything like that. School, that's all they learn. White people policy. And nothing about Dene, most of them. This, two weeks ago we had a workshop out in Atlanta, and we talked about uh, how to learn the knowledge. I had my brother there, he was helping. And Walter, everybody know Walter Bea, he was there too. And they spoke up and they said, we went to residential school and when we come back, we think we're a white man. Because we didn't know nothing about, we were taken away when we were just small. Came back as teenagers and uh, we didn't know our language. So that made, me, that made them think they're white people. And when last week, when we were at the bush camp, they spoke that what we we're learning, the young little kids, Teenagers, they said, it's the first time they're learning too. 
They're learning what we're learning, the little kids. So, everybody needs help. When we talk about money, we have to talk about all the kids or our leaders that went to residential school. They need help too. Because pretty soon, it's going to be them working with the kids. If they don't know their grandfather background, the knowledge, how are they going to turn, how are they going to teach their kids? So, before we lose all the elders, I think we should act on it. How we can help one another to become one. That's important. This is what we're trying to do. We all come from one person. But we're all lost. We don't know who we are. But working together, turning to one another, love one another, that'll bring us back together. And we can all learn together to make our grandfather's life strong again. Thank you, my people. Thanks for the little time you gave me. Merci. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for those amazing words. Um, okay, one brief, brief comment, and then we'll have to wrap up here. I just want to let everyone know we have our um, Denny Wellness um, newsletter, community wellness newsletter. If you guys want to see more programs being delivered. With all the programs that's been delivered, we deliver in Dilo and here. So all that list of uh, programs that I mentioned earlier, it's both in, in both communities. And their newsletter is online, so it's available uh -huh. for everyone who wants to. So thank you so much to the three of you for your presentation. It was very informative, sharing your um, land programs. Uh, we just have a gift we'd like to give you as a token of our appreciation. If anyone has any more questions or comments that they'd like to share, they will be in the building for the next couple of days, so please feel free to approach them at any time. <laughs>